A few centuries after Jesus was crucified, when Christianity became more than an underground religion and congregants began building public places of worship, the worshipers began to desire more than merely a plain room or unadorned building for the purpose. Over the centuries that followed, Catholic and Orthodox churches evolved to be, in some cases, extremely ornate, with beautiful imagery, stained glass windows, and statuary. Protestant Reformation, many of the churches that espoused Protestant doctrines eliminated that ornamentation in varying degrees. However, in nearly all cases, much of the remaining imagery and architectural features bear some relationship to biblical and spiritual references. On October 11, 1970, ground was broken for a new church building in the little eastern Pennsylvania town of Albertus. Nearly one year later, that building was dedicated as the Church of the Good Shepherd United Church of Christ. The design of the church building incorporated many elements of Christian tradition. This program discusses those design elements and how they link to the Bible and Christianity. A steeple tops the main sanctuary building, incorporating the Protestant empty cross, an image of the cross on which Jesus was crucified as it appeared after he had risen from the dead. This empty cross symbolizes God's love for all who receive his calling. Integrated into the steeple is a carillon, whose music invites people to enter and join in worship. The exterior facing of the front of the church building is not brick or block, which are made by the ingenuity of human beings, but stone, which is created under the will and purpose of God. Because the type of stone is metamorphic, which has been changed in form through heat and pressure, the exterior facing is symbolic of the metamorphism of Jesus Christ, who, before appearing on earth, was in the form of divinity, and, after his birth on earth, was in the form of both divinity and humanity. The interior of the church follows a fairly traditional layout, featuring a nave with pews in the center, a chancel and altar at the eastern end, and a semi-transept or wing on each side of the chancel, so that an aerial view of the church would give it the shape of an empty cross. Unfortunately, space restrictions made it necessary to abbreviate the right-hand wing or southern semi-transept so that the cross shape is somewhat distorted. A large stained glass window, the Word of God window, essentially replaces that wing. A narthex or lobby area at the west end of the sanctuary houses the main entrance doors. West is the direction of the setting sun and the fading light. It is the direction of darkness and, symbolically, sin. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul wrote that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, the church summons all people to its doors. When the congregation decided to leave the former Lehigh Zion Union Church and build the present structure, the new church needed its own name. The committee to propose a name held three meetings. At the third meeting, several viable possible names were discussed, but none seemed to be truly suitable or fitting. At that point, the late Reverend Charles E. Fogel, founding pastor of the present church, stated that in his opinion our church was the Church of Jesus Christ. He then read from his personal Bible a verse from the Gospel according to John that reads, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Reverend Fogel proposed the new name of the church to be Church of the Good Shepherd United Church of Christ. The committee agreed, and the congregation unanimously approved the name. The cross-shaped stained glass window, located in the upper portion of the facade of the church building, is the Good Shepherd window, the signature element identifying the name of our church. The window pictures a staff and a sheep, 
implying a shepherd, and since the sheep is peacefully resting, the implication is a relationship which is good. Therefore, the window depicts the good shepherd. In summary, our journey of faith begins with God's welcoming call to all people from the West to experience the sight and sound of God's love for them through Christ, who is the good shepherd and the rock of our salvation. Upon receiving God's welcoming call, we enter through the western front doors into the narthex of the church building. The narthex is a place of gathering and greeting. The high ceiling of the narthex creates a feeling of human humbleness and modesty. It draws the eye upward, lifts the mind toward God, and inspires a sense of the awesomeness and majesty of God. The narthex also provides a historical perspective of the life of our congregation. The display case on the southern wall contains long-handled wooden offering boxes of the past, anniversary memorial plates, and the shovel used at the groundbreaking service to commemorate the start of the construction of our church building. The display case on the northern wall contains the memorial book. Over the course of numerous three-year building fund campaigns to ultimately pay for the construction of the church building, past and some present members of the congregation donated funds to pay for specific church features from altar to organ, from pulpit to pew, from carpeting to window and beyond. Each donated church feature, the persons honored or memorialized by the donation, and the donors of the gift are listed on individual pages of the memorial book, which serves as a constant reminder of the will, dedication, and sacrifice of all the saints who, by the grace of God, brought this beloved church into being. As we continue our journey of faith, we leave the narthex and travel into the nave of the church. The nave lies between the glass panels forming the east wall of the narthex and the chancel rail. The central aisle is blanketed by a carpet of crimson, symbolically representing the blood of Christian martyrs who are witnesses for Christ and who suffer death rather than denying their faith. And so we walk down the straight and narrow path, supported by the inspiration and conviction of the martyrs. We take our place in the pews facing east, the direction of the rising sun. In the original 1971 church building, the number of pews from the north side wall across to the south side wall was 13, reminiscent of the 13 disciples. There were originally 12 disciples, and when Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Jesus, died as told in the Gospel according to Matthew, lots were cast to find a replacement. The lot fell on Matthias, who was enrolled with the other 11 disciples as described in the Acts of the Apostles. So, as you take your place in the pews, you symbolically are sitting as a disciple of Christ. This love that bonds God and disciples is symbolized by the laminated arches that support the structure of the church building. Individually, each strip of wood in every arch is weak to the point of being totally incapable of carrying the load bearing upon it from the walls, ceiling, roofing, and external forces such as wind and snow. However, when the individual weak wooden strips are glued together with the proper orientation and necessary bend, collectively working in unison as one united whole, the result is an incredibly strong arch. So it is with disciples supporting a church. Although individually weak, when disciples are glued together by the love of God, being in full accord, having a common mind, and working with unified purpose, the result is a rugged, fortified, and thriving church. From the pews, seven arches are visible. The number seven is the sum of three and four. Three symbolically represents the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Four symbolically represents humankind, as people come from the four cardinal points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. 
If three, representing the Godhead, and four, representing humanity, are united or combined, the result, seven, represents the complete perfect union of the Holy Trinity and humankind. Thus, when viewed from the pews, the church is upheld by seven arches, which symbolically represent the unity of the Godhead and humanity. But there exists an eighth arch, out of the view from the pews. The number eight represents a new beginning or a new order. This eighth arch, which lies beyond the present view of disciples seated in the nave and adds additional support and strength to the church, symbolically represents a new life. It represents heaven. The north and south side walls of our church building are anchored to a foundation set firmly in the earth and extend skyward toward heaven. They are painted white, a color that represents purity and its attributes, morality, integrity, virtue, righteousness, and holiness. As such, the white side walls symbolize the purity of the church, purity of thoughts, purity of words, and purity of deeds. The ceiling of the church building is composed of three-inch thick laminated tongue and groove planks running east and west in the main body of the nave, while the planks of the north semi-transept above the choir loft and of the south semi-transept above the Word of God stained glass window lie in a north and south arrangement. Hence, the orientation of the ceiling planks produces a mental image of a Latin or Roman cross with the longer descending arm above the pews. Further, above the altar, the Greek cross with arms of equal length in the shape of a mathematical plus sign is clearly visible as formed by the ceiling ridge beam and perpendicular extension beams from the north and south semi-transepts. In summary, our faithful response to God's welcoming call begins in the narthex with a heartfelt appreciation of the efforts of past generations on our behalf and continues to the nave where we walk the straight and narrow path as exemplified by martyrs and sitting pews as disciples of Christ, bonded by the love of God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and restored by a blessed assurance. The chancel of our church building lies between the chancel rail and the reredos, which is the east wall upon which is mounted the cross and candles. It is from the chancel that the word of God is spoken from the pulpit, sung by the choir, sounded by musical instruments, and enacted through liturgical dance. Three steps will elevate this relationship into the full bloom of eternal fellowship. The first step is faith. The Heidelberg Catechism and the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans both reveal that true faith is a sure knowledge by which we hold as true all that God has revealed to us in Scripture and the wholehearted trust that God, by the gift of grace through the atoning blood of Christ, freely grants to those who have faith in Jesus forgiveness of sins, redemption, eternal righteousness, and salvation. The second step is hope. Hope is a confident expectation with certain assurance that an event will happen but has not happened yet. The letter to the Hebrews reveals that hope is the anchor of the soul. The third step is love. The love referred to is the highest form of love, agape love, which embraces a universal, unconditional, willful love that transcends and persists regardless of circumstance. Therefore, the three steps in the chancel symbolically represent the path to eternal fellowship with God, as described by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. So faith, hope, love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The pulpit, or lectern, is solid symbolically a sure foundation for the Word of God spoken from its platform, and also elevated, symbolically located on a mountaintop, so that the Word of God is spread over and among all recipients. 
the Bible placed upon it remains forever open, indicating that the Word of God is forever available to those who seek wisdom, knowledge, truth, and understanding. In the original 1971 church building, there were three sedilia, or wooden seats, symbolically the seats of wisdom of the Holy Trinity, located on the extreme south side of the chancel for clergy and others leading the worship service. The choir loft in the north semi-transept provides seats for the choir who join the congregation in singing the word of God. Thus, the choir and congregation follow the teachings of Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Come into his presence with singing. Protestant tradition holds that there are two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion, which are holy signs and seals instituted by God to make us understand more clearly the promise of the gospel and further lead us down the path to eternal fellowship with God. Our baptismal font has a square base, symbolically calling people from the four corners of the earth, a circular body symbolically a sign of eternal salvation, and a cover featuring a descending dove representing the Holy Spirit descending upon the one to be baptized. John the Baptist and we in our church outwardly baptize with water to symbolically wash away sins, realizing that along the path to eternal fellowship with God, Christ will enter our lives and we will be inwardly baptized with the Holy Spirit. The altar, or communion table, holds the bread and wine for the Lord's Supper, which reminds us that we share in Christ's sacrifice of body and blood on the cross for the redemption and salvation of all who believe with true faith into Christ. Further, as we stand at the altar of God, according to the teachings in Paul's letter to the Romans, we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of our minds, so as to prove what is the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. The candles mounted on the Reredos are arranged in two sets of three candles, and the same theme of two sets of three appears also in the glass panels at the entrance of the church building and in the windows on the north sidewall, all with the same symbolism. The number two represents both contrast, like day and night, and unity, like two people form one marriage. The number three represents the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The contrasting two sets of three candles represent the light of the Holy Trinity shining for the saints of heaven and earth. The light blends into the one true light of the world as described in the Gospel according to John. The cross, the most widely recognized symbol of Christianity, mounted on the Reredos overlooking the nave and chancel, serves as a constant reminder of the love of God for his people. The cross is empty, symbolizing that Jesus the Christ, the Lord of glory, is risen. And so the architecture and furnishings of our church building symbolize a journey of faith, whereby God's welcoming call is answered by our faithful response, which culminates into an eternal fellowship through faith, hope, and love, through hearing and singing the word of God, through baptism and holy communion, through our living sacrifice, through the light of the Holy Trinity, and through the cross. As Christians, we offer our thanks and praise to God for his blessings upon this church in the past and pray for his loving guidance and grace in the future according to his righteous will and purpose. All four 
stained glass windows in our church building were designed and fabricated by Willett Studios, founded by William and Ann Lee Willett in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1898. Willett Studios is an organization of designers, artists, and craftsmen with a premier national and international reputation of producing the finest quality stained glass windows in the world with completed projects in all 50 states and at least 14 foreign countries. Their windows are found, for example, in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. and the Cadet Chapel at the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. According to Wikipedia, in the 1950s, the company was one of the first American studios to produce faceted stained glass windows as featured in our church building. After each window is designed with consideration of the location, shape, size, and color of each individual piece of glass within the design, blocks of brightly colored glass, typically about one inch thick, but over two inches thick in some cases to generate special effects, are cut to shape and size, and then faceted or individually chipped along the perimeter of the front face with a hammer in the hands of a master craftsman to enhance the brilliance, color dispersion known as fire and sparkle of the glass which now displays a jewel-like quality. The pieces of faceted glass are then arranged in their proper location according to the window design and bonded together with a pouring of epoxy to form a breathtaking structural stained glass window. When viewed outside the church building, outside the house of God, the windows are flat and appear drab and without luster, but when seen from within the church building, within the fortress of God, the windows boldly project the brilliance of God's light. The Good Shepherd Window, the signature element identifying the name of our church as the Church of the Good Shepherd, the United Church of Christ, is located on the west front wall above the main entrance of our church building. The window is in the shape of a Latin cross, the principal symbol of the Christian religion. The cross symbolically recalls the crucifixion of Christ and the resulting redeeming salvation of humankind through the love, grace, and mercy of God. Implying a shepherd, the window depicts a staff and a sheep, and, since the sheep is peacefully resting, the implication is a good relationship. In this way, the window depicts the good shepherd. Furthermore, the single staff symbolically illustrates the spiritual power of the one true good shepherd, who is in a loving relationship with each individual sheep under his care. The good shepherd employs his staff, to protect the flock from harm, to offer guidance and correction to the sheep when they are going astray, and to draw the flock together in community. The Good Shepherd comforts the sheep and leads the flock to green pastures and still waters. The Word of God window is located on the south wall of the chancel. The upper portion of this window symbolically features the Holy Trinity. God the Father in the top center, God the Son on the left, and God the Holy Spirit on the right, with rays of light emanating radially from the Father upon all creation. The lower portion of this window presents five panels symbolic of great teachings of the Old and New Testaments. At the top center of the window is the hand of God. God's hand is open, glorious in power, and upholding. God's hand writes your name in the Book of Life, and its handiwork extends beyond our utmost comprehension. The book of Ezra reveals that the hand of our God is for good upon all who seek him. Directly below God's hand in the window is the open Bible. The Bible contains God's written word, which is open to be received by all humanity. John tells us in his gospel that the word of God is truth. The letter to the Hebrews explains that the word of God is living and active. Psalm 119 tells us that the word of God is unchangeable and eternal. In his letter, James calls us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. To the left of the open Bible is Alpha, the first letter of the 24-letter Greek alphabet, which looks the same as the English letter A, and to the right is Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, which looks rather like a horseshoe. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. The symbolism of the Alpha and Omega relates to the eternal nature of God as revealed in Revelation. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This same theme is found also in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. In Psalm 90, Moses prays, Lord, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The prophet Isaiah reports, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Further, the Hebrew word formed by the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the 14th or middle letter, and the last or 28th letter, when transliterated into English, is emet, meaning truth, indicating that truth, which in the Jewish religion is understood to be the seal of God, who is Jesus the Christ in the Christian religion, is from everlasting to everlasting. The prophet Zechariah reveals the Lord, saying, These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. In the upper left of the Word of God window is the anchor, which is a symbol of safety, steadfastness, and hope that keeps our ship of life from drifting onto sandbars or dashing onto the rocks. The letter to the Hebrews states that we have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner shrine behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. In his first letter, the Apostle Peter adds that by God's great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself is our hope, and therefore Jesus is the anchor of our souls. Notice that the anchor image has a ring on both ends of the shank. The anchor rope would be permanently attached to the lower ring at the fluke end, passed along the length of the shank and loosely bound with a light cord to, but not through, the upper ring. Under normal circumstances, the anchor was raised from the bottom of the waters to the boat by the upper ring. However, if the anchor fluke was wedged under the edge of a rock, a heavy pull on the anchor rope would break the light cord on the upper ring, and the anchor could be backed out from under the rock and retrieved by the anchor rope fixed to the lower ring. Thus, symbolically, the anchor, Jesus Christ, is constantly accessible in our lives. Also in the upper left of the Word of God window appears a contemporary image of a fish with several other similar fish images scattered throughout the window. The traditional fish image is simply a pair of interwoven arcs. The fish is one of the earliest symbols representing Jesus Christ. The first Christians faced persecutions for their faith during the first century after Christ. If two strangers met, the Christian would draw an ark on the ground with his or her sandal or walking stick. If the other person was a Christian, he or she would respond by drawing the symmetric ark to form the outline of a fish. Hence the fish was the symbol by which Christians identified strangers who were also Christians. The vast majority of early Christians spoke Greek, a very widespread language at the time. In English, the word fish is spelled F-I-S-H. In Greek, the word fish is spelled Iota Chi Theta Upsilon Sigma, pronounced ichthys. That then becomes the Greek acrostic Jesus Christos Theo Ios Soter which translates into English as the anointed Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, a powerful five-word statement of faith. In summary, the image of the fish symbolically represents Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Savior of the world. The upper right of the Word of God window is the descending dove, which symbolizes the Holy Spirit, who moved over the waters at creation in Genesis, instructed the prophets of the Old Testament in Zechariah, alighted on Jesus after his baptism in all four Gospels, filled the apostles on Pentecost at the birth of the church in Acts, and washes humankind with the waters of renewal throughout time, according to the Apostle Paul in his letter to Titus. The Holy Spirit offers peace
peace and comfort, according to the Heidelberg Catechism, intercession in our prayers, as Paul explained in his letter to the Romans, and spiritual gifts, such as faith, wisdom, and service, according to Paul's letter to the Romans, his first letter to the Corinthians, and his letter to the Ephesians. How does a person know that the Holy Spirit dwells within their being? Well, a person knows that a tree dwelling within their orchard is an apple tree, if that tree produces apples. Likewise, a person knows that a tree dwelling within their orchard is a peach tree, if that tree produces peaches. In similar fashion, a person knows without doubt that the power dwelling within their being is the Holy Spirit, if that power produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against which there is no law, as the Apostle Paul explains in his letter to the Galatians. As Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, God gives us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our redemption and adoption as his sons and daughters, and therefore heirs. As Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians and in his letter to the Galatians, and of God's promise to be received by true faith, as Paul wrote in Galatians, the Holy Spirit remains with the believer forever, according to John's Gospel. The lower portion of the Word of God window contains five panels, symbolic of teachings found in the Old and New Testaments. The lower left panel presents an image of the two tablets of the law given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. As recorded on the tablets, God says to his people, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image, nor bow down to them or serve them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. In the Gospels according to Matthew, chapter 22, verse 35 through 40, Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, and Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 28, when Jesus was asked which is the greatest commandment, he replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The second from the left lower panel contains the image of the tongues and burning coal. This image is symbolic of the vision of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah as he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up in the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim took a burning coal with tongues from the altar, flew to Isaiah, touched his lips with the burning coal, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin forgiven. Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Isaiah replied, Here am I, send me. And the Lord said, Go and say to this people, Hear and understand with your hearts, and turn and be healed. The third from the left lower panel contains images of the star, the Cairo, and the manger, symbolic of the teaching found in the Gospel according to John. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. The five-pointed star, which is the star of Bethlehem, is shaped in the basic form of a human being and leads us by its brilliant light to the incarnation of Christ. The Cairo, which appears like an English letter X superimposed on a letter P, is a symbol representing Christ, as it is formed by superimposing the first two capital letters of the Greek word Christos, or Christ, meaning anointed. The manger is the initial cradle of Jesus upon his appearing on earth in human form. 
Animals go to the manger for physical food for their bodies. We go to the manger for spiritual food for our souls. The star, the Cairo, and the manger collectively represent the Incarnation, God's Word made flesh in the form of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. The fourth from the left lower panel features the lamp of knowledge. In the Old Testament, Psalm 119 reveals that the Word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The book of Proverbs affirms that the commandment of God is a lamp, and the teaching is a light. In the New Testament, Matthew records Christ saying that his followers should let the light of the lamp of their lives so shine before others that the others may see their good works and give glory to God in heaven. Further, the lamp of knowledge symbolizes the inspired teachings of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Peter, Jude, the undetermined writer of Hebrews, and other teachers throughout the ages. The right lower panel of the Word of God window features an image of Christ represented by the blue chi Rho in the upper left, governing the blue sky in the upper right, the green land in the middle, and the wavy sea containing a fish in the lower portion. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar. Then shall all creation sing for joy before the Lord. The Holy Spirit window with its three panels is located on the east wall of the choir loft. The center panel displays a descending dove, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit and reminiscent of Christ's baptism, as Matthew explains in his Gospel, and the birth of the church at Pentecost, as described in Acts, filling the hearts, minds, and souls of the multicolored and multilingual peoples of the earth with its testimony enhanced by the distribution of red tongues of fire. The Holy Spirit calls disciples out from the world to be ambassadors for Christ with the ministry of reconciliation and salvation, as Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians. According to Matthew in the Great Commission, the resurrected Christ spoke to the eleven remaining disciples and bid them to go and make disciples of all nations. Interestingly, the Holy Spirit window displays the images of exactly eleven disciples, seven to the left of the earth image and four to the right. The Protestant tradition holds that there are two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. In the Holy Spirit window, the left panel is symbolic of the sacrament of baptism, while the right panel images the sacrament of Holy Communion. In the left panel, the scallop shell, viewed with its many grooved line segments running from the outer rim at the top of the panel to a meeting point at the base of the panel, represents the many human pathways that lead to the universal center, to God. In a more detailed view, the tipped vessel drips cleansing drops of living baptismal water taken from the eternal source of life, as symbolized by the fish. Further, in Luke's Gospel, John the Baptist announces that he baptizes with water, but one mightier than he, the Christ, will baptize with the Holy Spirit, and by the Spirit we are all baptized into one body, the body of Christ, as Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians. In the right panel, the sacrament of Holy Communion is symbolized by two collections of images. On the left side of the panel are presentations of the wheat and the wafers, which are symbolic of the communion bread, while on the right side of the panel are views of the grapes and the chalice, which represent the communion wine. The bread is the communion of the body of Christ, the wine is the communion of the blood of Christ. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul reveals that the believer should eat the communion bread and drink the communion wine in remembrance of Christ until his coming again. The three panels of the Holy Spirit window, representing the coming of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in baptism, and the work of the Spirit in Holy Communion, are unified by the seven flames sweeping across the upper and middle portions of the entire window. As explained by the prophet Isaiah, 
The seven flames represent the seven gifts of the Spirit of the Lord resting upon Christ, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord, and delight. Since Christ, as symbolized by the fish in each of the three window panels, is the overflowing fountain of grace, from his fullness the members of the body of Christ also receive the Holy Spirit of grace. The Triumph and Joy window, with its three panels, is located on the west wall of the choir loft and, unfortunately, is not visible to those sitting in the nave of the church. The upper center panel displays the throne and the crown, symbolic of the victory, power, authority, and reign of Christ, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, according to the book of Revelation. Luke wrote in his gospel that of his kingdom there will be no end. Psalm 89 tells us that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. And James wrote in his letter that Christ will reign as the Lord of glory. The letter to the Hebrews states, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. A palm branch is found on both sides of the throne and the crown. The palm branch is a symbol of triumph, peace, and eternal life. Even under stressful external conditions, the palm tree exhibits determined growth, symbolic of the victory of the spirit over the flesh. Psalm 92 reveals that the righteous flourish like the palm tree. The lower center panel contains an image of the orb and cross, globus cruciger in Latin, meaning cross-bearing orb. The cross is symbolic of the sacrifice of Christ for the salvation of his people, while the orb, or globe, represents the current world. Since the cross is fixed above the orb, the symbolism represents the triumph of the cross of Christ over the powers of this world. The left panel contains an image of Christ's presence, symbolized by the fish in the upper and lower portions of the panel, and human struggles represented by the ship of life in the center portion, tossed to and fro by the stormy waves or involved with a great fish, as found in the story of Jonah in the Old Testament. As Matthew reported in his Gospel, Christ says to his disciples, Lo, I am with you always, to the close of the age. The right panel, which is above an exit door, contains an image of the crossed keys, which represent the keys of heaven. In Matthew's Gospel, Christ says to his disciple Peter, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Sin locks us out of heaven, and Christ's victory on the cross unlocks the gates of heaven, so his joyous people can enter. And so, through the love and grace of God, the victory of Christ as seen in the triumph and joy window, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as revealed in the Holy Spirit window, and the indwelling of the Word within our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits as viewed in the Word of God window, we are bound together as the Church of the Good Shepherd United Church of Christ, symbolized by the Good Shepherd window. May this Church remain ever faithful to the mission for which it has been called. Praise and glory be to God from everlasting to everlasting.